Well, we're back and this is Underwater Answers and we're going to be looking at an absolutely devastating method in this episode and that method is zig rigging. Yep, zigs are an awesome method, especially at this time of year. We've been asked loads and loads on Facebook for uh, Husey to have a look at them underwater, so you're the man. Absolutely, let's get in a drink. Before I had the chance to even get my kit on, the heavens opened and it threw it down. I'd already deployed a couple of three foot high black zig aligners to the shallow bar that runs across the middle of Thorpe Lee and the rain had only just eased off when one of those zigs ripped off and I was playing another car. You know what, zigs are absolutely devastating, even on days like today where there's quite a big wind blowing and we've had bright sunshine, we've had pouring rain, we've had heavy cloud, low pressure and high pressure coming in now as well, but just so, so effective if you get it right. And it's actually not that difficult to get it right either. I think people sometimes overcomplicate what they're doing and zigs are a really, really easy and simple method. And there we go. That's another one in the bag. Yes. Just watch that fish go back in again. Lovely seeing them swimming off. But while I've been down here, I've seen something else which is really, really interesting and also very important. And it's this. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nymph larva cases on the surface. Now, what's happening at the moment is that the sun's out. They're coming up through the water, swimming up to the surface, hatching out on the surface. And these are the skins that are being blown down here on the wind. Now, when you get a hatch like this, the fish are all over it, and that is why zigs can be so effective. With the rods reeled in, I geared up for the first dive. I wanted to have a look at different colours and how each colour behaved underwater. So I got Harry to cast out three zigs, a yellow one, a red one and a black one, and I dipped down to have a look. The first thing you will notice is that the colour of the water is very green. This is the case with most venues in the UK with clear water, and it really does affect how different colours look underwater. Believe it or not, I'm currently no more than about six foot away from the yellow zig aligner and slowly getting closer, but it's nearly impossible to see it. It's not until I change my position to look down on it does it become visible. Looking down, the background is darker because of the lake bed, meaning the light yellow colour does show up more. Interestingly, looking laterally at the zig in close proximity, I'm about two foot away here, the colour is bright, very bright. And bizarrely, with the sun's rays shining through the ripple on the surface, the zig is actually strobing, flashing like a beacon. Now, if I was a carp, I would treat this with a lot of caution. With yellow and green being so close on the colour spectrum, yellow from a distance is very hard to pick up. However, when you're up close to it, it stands out massively. On to black now, and instantly you can see why it's such a successful colour. It stands out without being garish and in your face. It just looks very natural. When the sun was out and the light rays were streaming through the ripple, it didn't flash like the yellow, and this is because black absorbs light rather than reflects it. So you can see why in bright, clear conditions, like the ones we've been faced with at Thorpley, black is a winner every time. It also is clearly visible from a good distance away. As I steadily back away from the zig, it doesn't disappear in the background like the yellow one did. Just like black, red stood out from quite a distance away. Once you get up close, you can really tell how bright red is underwater. It stands out amazingly. It silhouetted very well when looking up and was bright as you can get when looking down. However, to me, it still didn't quite win over the black. I headed back to shore to discuss with Harry my findings. Right, so was that interesting? Mate, it's always interesting, isn't it? It's always interesting, but there was a couple of key things that we've picked up about the colours straight away. Yeah. Um, and for me, black is the one. Without any shadow of a doubt, I reckon 80% of the time, black will be it. Yeah. And then there'll be 20% of the time where you can add a bit of colour or you can use a different one and that will work. So, so why, why would you say black? Was it more 
visual, less visual, bit more natural. This is going to sound really crazy now, but it was all three of those things. So for a start, black is matching the buzzer hatch. And yeah, which there is, you know, literally, we've, they're coming off now. You we've seen see. loads and loads and loads of things, and, and, and things coming up off the bottom aren't red or yellow. No. or pink or brown or any no. other color of the spectrum that you know what they're black with a bit of white on yeah. it yeah, yeah. and you know we've, we've seen it before with photographs i've taken of these emerging nymphs that's where this came from in the first place the shape of it so it's lovely to see that it actually works but yeah. you can see why yeah because from a distance it's matching a hatch so talking about matching a hatch if you're spotting corn go on yellow if you're spotting maggots yeah go red. on red yeah, yeah exactly and i know i know tom maker for example you know he fishes lots of venues where um lots of maggots have been used in the past or they do currently get used and red zigs work really well in the winter when yep. people are putting maggots in and even if is, you're not putting maggots in but this is so much about carp fishing now that we have to remember and it's conditioning these fish are pressured fish wherever they are they fished for all the time and they learn and i'm not saying they're einstein clever but they learn about how to get an easy meal. So if they get used to maggots being spotted at them, they're going to eat red things that are sinking. It's as simple as that. If they see yellow stuff coming down and they eat it and it's corn, guess what? When they yeah. see some yellow stuff, they're going to have a crack at that. Yeah. When they see black things going from the bottom up, they're going to eat them and think, yeah. oh, that's food as well. So, so, so this situation that we're fishing now and what a lot of people will uh, find themselves in, clear water, they're not spotting out any bait. Yeah. Black. Um, yeah. Black every day of the week. If you want to put a little fleck of red on it, that sort of acts as a bit of a sight bob, so it will just draw it out a little bit more. But, you know, for me, I just think black works. So black and black, and that's it. That's, yeah. that's me done now. Um, there were a couple of other really interesting things about it. Firstly, light conditions changing. Now, okay. light conditions change all the way through the yeah. course of the day from early morning through to late at night and then we have Clyde coming over we have sun we have shade of trees all these things make a big difference now the yellow in particular in bright water strobed You've, yeah so it's, that's you know look at it it's incredible isn't it it's actually strobing it's, it's flashing on flashing. and off and that's because if you imagine the surface of the water when it's flat light is coming in flat but when there's waves on it the light hits it but then because the wave is up and down the light wave is bending so as yeah. it goes into water, it's effectively doing that. Now, when it's hitting the zig, it's flashing. When it's off, it goes off, on, off, on, off. It's and the literally more... like, a, like a lighthouse, it's, isn't it? It's, it's saying, look, I'm here. Exactly I'm here. that. Now, um, to me, that looks a little bit off-putting. Yeah. We don't know what it's like to the carp. No. But yeah, after seeing but, that, it doesn't look good. But that's only when it's bright and there's a chop. Yes. Now, in diffused conditions, when it's slightly duller, actually yellow gets a little bit brighter. But remember again the colour wheel that I talk about a lot, mm. that if you want something to stand out, you've got to change it from the colour that's behind it. If you want something to blend in, make it the same area of colour. And when you look laterally underwater in anybody's footage, you'll see that it looks green. Because it, algae sits in the water in fresh water and laterally it's green. It's greeny yellow. The brighter the sun, the more yellow it is. The darker the sun, the more green it is. So, if you're putting something yellow mid-water against a yellowy-green background, guess what? It's going to be camouflaged. So all those people that think they're using a bright yellow bait because it's bright are actually not. They're disguising it a little bit. Yeah, well, looking, looking at this footage, when you're further away from the yellow one, it's, it's quite hard to see. Whereas, like, the red one and the black one, yep. they're easier to pick out further away but then when you get up close to them the yellow one is like stands wow, out because yellow. you're getting the light off it that's right yeah. and it's exactly that 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 yellow will reflect more light but it will be camouflaged from a distance so this is probably why it works very well when you're spotting over zigs and putting yellow corn in and it's cloudy because there's less light around it's diffusing it you're not getting that flash yeah and the yellow stands out because the fish are condensed and the fish in that are, area the fish are, yeah they're in they're and around there. it so it's literally it's there and it's like oh there it is precisely now a black one isn't going to give off any light but what a black one does is it stands out in a bluey greeny yellowy background because it's very very vivid and if you think of a danger sign it's yellow and black a lot of it so those two are exact opposites so they stand out so if you've got yellowy greeny water everyone thinks oh black's really hard to see yes it is hard to see because you're looking down 
Yeah. Now fish aren't looking down, they're looking sideways, which is the advantage I have because I always get to look sideways yeah. at these things. And when you look sideways, you can see that it really stands out. The other thing is that there's been research recently about how fish see and they've got polarising filters in their eyes. And right. what that allows them to do is pick out a focal point in an area where it's very hard to focus. And the easiest way I can describe this to somebody that, that hasn't dived underwater and seen it laterally is trying to take a photograph in fog. Now, if you imagine trying to take a photograph either in fog or through a smoky room, it's really difficult because the focal point can't be picked up by the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas as soon as you put a polarising filter on, what it does is it makes things jump out. So because carp have got polarising filters in their eyeballs, they can pick out individual objects. Now if the individual object is a different, completely different colour to what's behind it, it stands out really well. It Guess what? Yeah, black. black. Yeah. Once again, so it's a match the hatch. Yeah. It doesn't and then also flash. also red, I guess, uh, is the sort of next one to go down because it's the other end of the spectrum Absolutely. from it's yellow exactly and green. It's yeah. exactly opposite. It's exactly opposite. If you look at the yellow and greeny end of the spectrum, directly opposite is red. Yeah. So again, it stands out a little bit more, but it stands out for different reasons. And what's interesting to me is that it doesn't jump out. You can see it from further away, but it doesn't actually jump out. Yellow you can't see until you get close to it. Mm. Black you can see, but it doesn't really jump out. It's always steady. It's always there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see a dot in the distance, and then when you get there, it's still clearly there. But you can so, focus so on it. Yeah, so it's not a scary thing to them. No. At all. No. And, and yeah, like we said, when they're eating things that are yellow, great and whether eating things that are red yes. great but this is kind of confirmed i mean i've done a lot of zig zig rig fishing in the past and black in clear water when you're just fishing single zigs is the way to go for that's sure. it that's it if i was mark pictures i'd say once you've had black you won't go back and that <laughs> <laughs> on that bombshell we'll move on to the next part <laughs> time of the evening when bites come if you stick it in the right place they come really really quickly and this is the second bite in ooh, five minutes all off the bar out there and it's very interesting because harry's had a couple of bites as well and what's very clear is that these fish are currently feeding on a hatch absolutely crystal clear you can see them coming up hitting the surface uh, we've seen all the debris coming into the edge as well and there's other people fishing around the lake at the moment on the deck and the spots have been going in and so far I've not heard another alarm and if anybody has no confidence in zigs you really 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 do genuinely need to think again because it is a devastating method absolutely devastating and there we go that's another one in the net Nice little common, we'll have a look at him in a minute. But I would say that amongst the little bit of fishing first, going out, doing the diving, swimming around in the swim, seeing those fish, coming back in again, probably fish for about an hour. And I reckon that's now six bites. And do you know how much bait we've put in? Absolutely nothing.
broke and whilst we were waiting for the light levels to increase for my next dive we chucked the zigs back out and once again bites came instantly. This second dive was to be done out on the bar where we'd been getting our bites. I was going to be looking a bit deeper into how the zig behaves and also the bite indication. I really enjoyed this dive as you can see from the footage, the thought bleak carp was so inquisitive coming within feet of me. This is something I've found to be the case on a lot of my dives, rather than spooking off instantly the carp tend to swim up to me and check me out before making a decision as to whether I'm a friend or a foe. The first thing I did when I was out there was film the filamentous algae that litters the bottom of this lake. This is the stuff that when you reel it in it's on your lead and your rig and you could be fooled into thinking it's silkweed but it isn't. It's really claggy, heavy, slimy and sticks to everything. However when in the water it's really light and moves around all over the place. As you can see these fish have just swum over the area and from just a bit of water displacement from their tails as they swam off the algae is moving and rolling. Trust me when I say this, avoid it like the plague if you're fishing anything other than a zig. And not even a solid bag or a chod rig will present properly over this stuff. Find a clear spot or fish a zig. Back to the zigs and I wanted to look a bit more at the mechanics of the zig and what, if anything, affects its movement underwater. With a fair chop on the water and the zig sitting roughly a foot below the surface, the zig was leaning over slightly in the same direction as the wind. Now having only dived over zigs before on flat calm days, this was something I'd never experienced before. The amount this actually affects how high your zig sits in the water is negligible, but it certainly was an interesting find. For a short period I staked my camera out on a pole so I could gauge the carp's reaction to the zig, but unfortunately my presence and the presence of the camera seemed to put them off taking it. However, you do notice the slight movement in the zig when there are fish in and around it. You can see that whenever there is water displacement, the zig spins and turns in the water. Could this make it even more enticing to the carp? Big question. Once again, I'll discuss my findings with Harry. I think people are worried about zigs sometimes, aren't they? That, you know, it's, uh, oh, I don't really know too much about it. Oh, it's hard work, or oh, it's this, that, and the other. Actually, it's a piece of cake. Yes. Because you don't have to worry about spots. No. Absolutely no. no bother with spots. There's on the spot that we've got out there where we've been catching fish now, there is no way on this planet that you'd be able to present anything other than really a chod rig. And the yeah. chod rig would be goosed in a very short period of time because that weed would roll over it. Yeah. You've actually you've shown me footage of where the fish have gone over the weed. Yeah. And then you can see the weed the weed roll it, over. It moves and rolls. And, and if you had a it, even if you had a chod rig there that could quite easily just envelop it. Oh, no, not quite easily, it does. <laughs> it does. You know, it's as simple as that, it does all the time. That horrible silkweed is just horrendous, I hate it. If I find that in my peg and I can't find a spot, I've got a zig option or I'm not fishing. And um, so what is, so, so that silkweed, when you get it out, how do you know that it's that type of silkweed that will completely ruin you? Well, you can swim? see, it's, a lot of people call it candy floss weed. It's, it's, it's called filamentous algae, so it's not yeah. actually a weed. It's a filamentous algae, although the strong bits of it is, it's almost like on the border of being a weed. Yeah. And it just looks horrible. It's the stuff that's really difficult to pull off your line. Really slimy, isn't Really it? slimy, yeah. And you just get a little bit back and you think, oh, I'll be all right. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> game over. It's horrendous. So zig rig is, is the way to go. Is the one, that's it, get zigging. So 
you found out quite a bit when it was um, when it was windy earlier and you were out on that shallow area. Yes, um, and it was quite surprising actually because it did more or less the opposite to what I thought it would do. Although when you think about it afterwards, there's an obvious answer for it. And basically, when I've looked at zigs before, they've almost always just gone straight up. So that's fishing them within a foot, two foot of the surface. Now, the zig that was out there was a little bit closer to the surface, probably a foot or slightly less. And it was on the shallow bar with the wind blowing into us and it's a fairly fresh wind. And it was leaning. And it with was, the wind? With the wind, yeah. You now, you'd normally think that it would go the other way because obviously if you, if you know about wind and tow, wind will push it along the top and tow will take it back the other way underneath. But it's normally the bottom layers that tow yeah. and the top layers that, that push. However, this was leaning with it, and I think that's because it was a relatively new wind and it was coming this way because previously it had blown the other way. Yeah. So on a fresh wind, it does lean a little bit. Also, I think that, and I'm going to bring a new word into the uh, equation now, and that is pull, that I think the surface is where the surface moves, but then it will pull the surface layers for a foot or so underneath it yeah. with it, and that's what also moves yes yeah, so that's, under- that's why and and you can see these loads yeah. of particle as well going in the same direction at the same height exactly if you went much deeper than that i think the pull will be less and eventually it will get towed the other way so, after the wind has pushed so and turned do you around. think there would be the potential if you were fishing high enough up on a windy day for your for it to basically go like that in a, in a curve where the toe's going that way and the pull is going that way. Potentially, but I think the drag on the line going up would be small. The big drag is on the on the floaty bit, on the zig itself. Yeah, because so it's that's slightly gonna... more surface area for exactly. it to... Exactly, and also that's the buoyant bit that is more likely yeah. to be to be pushed or pulled or, or whatever. So if anything, so... it's going to lean over slightly with the wind if you're high up. Yes, and if you want to be really, really tedious about it, you can say that it's a 24.3 degree angle and there's a bit of lean. What it does, long and short of it, is that if there's a good wind on you know, high up, it leans a little bit, but it doesn't make a lot of difference. And if you want to work Pythagoras' theorem out and all of that, it'll probably make it about an inch less deep. Yeah, so, yeah in, shallower in, however, as opposed to less yeah, deep. Yeah. In but, 10 foot of water. So, yeah, so uh, it's not something to negligible, worry about. Negligible. So tow and wind, negligible. Um, while we're staying on mechanics, I think there is movement as well, because mm. that's another thing we have to... It doesn't bounce. No. So there's, I haven't seen any bounce at all. Does but it what sway? I've, I've seen a little bit of sway, but it's more when something goes past it. Yeah. Because when a fish moves past it, or alternatively when I go anywhere near it, obviously the very fact that I'm moving into water means that that water has to move somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. So it will move. So if a fish is swimming past, there is potential for it to move, but actually it's not going to move badly and it will be quite natural. The other thing is that there's a little bit of twist as well, that they rock ever so yeah. slightly. But I don't think that's a bad thing because actually it looks quite natural still. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of movement like, yes. what, you'd, like what you'd get. Um, yeah, if you were drop shotting for perch or something, just yeah. that tiny little bit of movement. And they're well, feeding on natural things that are moving. Exactly. If you're a bug and you're heading to the surface, you're not going to stop three quarters of the way up and have a look at the scenery. You don't <laughs> need a decompression hole. And remember that from the minute that you crawl from underneath your stone and shed your jacket to the minute that you fly out of the water, you are in serious jeopardy. So you've got to get out of there as quickly as possible. So on that note, I mean, we haven't had a chance to look at adjustable zigs, unfortunately, because we've run out of time. But do you think there is the potential to consistently work adjustable zigs through the water column all the time and it, and it could work? Oh, yeah, undoubtedly. Um, undoubtedly. And I think it depends on the carp that you're fishing for. If there's one in 300 acres, then you know what? You're probably using the wrong method. If you're somewhere like this, Thorpe Lee, where there's loads and loads of fish moving around all the time, they love movement so we've seen it when i get in the water they're on me like a shot every single time i go in the carp are there straight away in addition to that what i've noticed is that when the lead goes in the carp are straight on it to see what's just gone in yeah Yeah. and so they're swimming straight over it so if there's any movement they're really really inquisitive creatures these things and it goes back to the thing i was saying before that it's conditioning fish in pressured situations get conditioned to do something either to avoid because it's wrong and it's scary or alternatively to benefit because there is a benefit to it now food they hear something going in they think it might be food they go and have a look at it if it's movement they might go they're inquisitive they'll have a look at it obviously if they're pulling in then you've got more chance of catching one yeah um i don't think i'd be standing by the side of the rod pulling it up and down every 
two minutes. Like you could, but potentially, I reckon here there's an experiment to stand there doing that. But but what I th- I genuinely I mean it's a, it is a lot of effort, but I think it would work. You see match anglers on the pole, they're like that all yeah. the time, yeah. all the time, and half the time when it's going back in, float goes. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to spend that much <laughs> effort <laughs> going off. like that, but I do think it'd work. Yeah, I know. I reckon it would. That would be that would be a nice little challenge. That would let's let's see if we can get one on a moving zig in some <laughs> way, shape, or form, and you just wind it up and then wind it back down again. Um. So moving on, now a lot of people have asked me um, on Facebook for us to look at how the um, anti-tangle sleeve yes. sits and how much that affects. Why? Um, Why do they want to know that? Because if you, you, you know, an extra long anti-tangle sleeve is about two inches long. Yeah. And if they're being very critical with the depth, yeah. if it lies flat on the bottom, then that's two inches less that they're fishing up in the, up in the water less. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think, uh, having seen how these carp are behaving out here, they're travelling through at all sorts of levels. I think, all right, two inches might make a difference if you smack bang on the surface. On a, on a perfectly clear patch, then yes, it will lift a little bit. So but it, it doesn't that, sit vertical. Yeah, that's about sort of 45 degrees, maybe a little yeah. bit less. Yeah. So, inch. You've, so you're, yeah, it's an inch. So, really, if you're that worried about something that small, you need to have a word with yourself because genuinely that's not going to make that much difference. It really, really isn't. Because a lot of the time, remember, you're thinking that you've got to have it within an inch. Bottoms of lakes are not like snooker tables. You can't cast anywhere and it will be exactly the same no. depth. You know, you can cast two foot further away, what looks to be in the same spot, it might be six inches deeper. So that much is going to make no difference at all. Put it out of your minds, don't worry about it. Get black zigs on, fish them a couple of feet under the surface, bingo. You're in. <laughs> One, two, This is the setup that I've been casting out for Rob. It's how I set up my zigs and probably how most of the guys in the in the Fox team set up their zigs, perhaps with slight vari- variations depending on, on the situation. But yeah, basically what we've got here is a um, slick leg clip with a naked line tail rubber. Now, it's a very, very unique product. It's actually designed uh, specifically for naked lines. So it has a lovely taper right the way down to your naked line that really, really does help um, avoid tangles, which are obviously uh, a common problem with zig rigs. Equally, I've got an extra long anti-tangle sleeve there, which again aids the avoidance of tangles. With the leg clip as well, and the uh, tail rubber is very, very soft, so it comes off easily. Um, The slick leg clip has no ridges or anything, so it's designed to lose the lead very, very easily. Now with with zig rigs, it is harder for the fish to get rid of the lead because of the long hook link. Now, with the, I've found the, the best thing to do with the slick leg clip and the naked line tail rubber, uh, if you want to drop the lead, then you just need to um, make sure that it's slightly, slightly wet when you, um, when you put it on. So I literally just give it a bit of a, a bit of spit and then I just nick it on like that. So it's over the arm perhaps by a couple of mil. Um, if I wanted to keep the lead, you know, this this sort of situation, I guess, is 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 one of those where um, I'm wanting to not lose so many leads because we're getting quite a lot of bites. If the fish becomes tethered, I do want to lose the lead. If you just push the tail rubber on a little bit further, so it's almost flush, and um, yeah, that will ensure that you uh, you don't lose too many leads if you're getting lots and lots of bites 
but you do, uh, but it is still very, very safe for the fish. Right, so coming down from the anti-tangle sleeve, I've got 12 pound zig and floater line, my preferred starting point as it were i very very rarely go down in a breaking strain only if i'm fishing for smaller fish and in very open water situations i don't feel like i miss out on too many bites using a 12 over a 9 i do sometimes step up to a 15 if it's very weedy conditions or i'm fishing for very very big fish so um yeah 12 pound is what i've gone for at the moment and then that comes down to the zigger liner you know since these have come out i haven't i probably haven't cast out a different hook bait other than a zigger liner the angle that the line exits exits the aligner is absolutely perfect the hook holds are unreal and um yeah it really really has uh, improved my zig fishing without any doubt um over the last four or five years that they've been out now um, and then a zig and floater hook straight point very 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 sharp and i use it in a size six i do tend to prefer a bigger hook for my zig fishing or for most of my fishing to be honest because i feel like it gives me better chance of hooking the fish and better chance of me landing the fish so yeah i don't tend to worry that it's a big hook um, and it's off the bottom and the fish can see it because i don't believe that fish know what a hook is so yeah that's what um i'm casting out for Husey. that's what i cast out most of the time anyway and that's what we've been catching on as well finally we looked at bite indication we did three tests all using tight lines as we already know that it's the way to go for this style of fishing Instead, we will be looking at how your bite indicator choice affects indication. Harry set his RX Plus to the highest sensitivity possible and began using a black label micro head with a ball chain, which makes for a very lightweight setup. His lead was 4 ounces and his line was 23 pound Exocet monofilament, which he cast the 80 yards to where I was situated in the lake. I did the same test with all of them, moved the zig around to demonstrate how much movement there is without the lead dislodging, and then I picked the lead off the bottom and moved directly away from where Harry was situated on the bank. I guess I'd moved about six foot before feeling the resistance of the strike on that first test. Second up was a dumpy bobbin with a brass weight inside. Again, it was a similar distance travel before Harry picked up the rod. Lastly, it was the turn of the quiver arm. The adjustable hockey stick was pointing directly down and Harry was using the stiffest of the titanium arms in the black label range. Interestingly, on this occasion, there was a slight pullback at the lead end as the lead was lifted up off the lake bed until once again I travelled five to six feet before the strike. I was eager to check back through the footage on the bank with Harry to see how my findings in the water corresponded with bite indication on the bank. Right, so for the indication test, um, I used the uh, stiff quiver arm, yep. the micro head. I used a dumpy bobbin with the brass weight inside it and I use just a micro head with the pivoting clip. Um, you know, you can all interchange them however you want and I do use all of those bobbins in my own fishing for various things, but a lot of people just have one bobbin yeah, yeah. For, for, for their style of fishing. Now, um, as you said, we fished it all tight, all yeah. of them tight, so we wanted to find out which one worked better. So the first one, 
what did you find out with that? Well, it was interesting. To be fair, most of them were pretty good. But I think that's down to the fact that you're fishing tight line. Yeah. So and I'm all, talking like really as tight. tight as you can get yeah. it. As tight as you can get it. And you could feel that because it was it was jammed in the weed anyway. When I'm pulling out, it's jammed in the weed. So without any shadow of doubt, irrespective of bobbin, you've got to fish it tight. When you look at the different bobbins, the first one, I actually, I, f I did exactly the same test in all three. And that is, firstly, grab it and give it a bit of a move around. And all three of them, you know, there was a lot of kiting distance. Now, you can imagine if it's 12 foot rather than 4 foot, you can go even further. Yeah. So by the time that lead is moved, unless a fish has hit it and come up, then by the time that lead is moved, the fish has had the rig in its mouth for quite a long period of time. Yeah. Which, I have to say, that goes to show how good the ziggle liners are against just a standard bait because yeah, you've got uh, the liner liner. Yeah, there. yeah. And so, they're keeping that hook in place. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that's a really, really key issue. I think they work really well hooking-wise. Yeah. So rig efficiency on the zig liner is brilliant. So same test all the time give it a good little move around etc etc pick it up swim directly away from the bank yeah. and I could feel the tension pretty quickly but I didn't feel the strike for probably meter meter and a half so six foot seven foot maybe so a reasonable way that could be down to line stretch that could be down to the fact that it's bedding at the weed you know there's a lot of things there yeah um, I, I, I think probably line stretch must be a, a, a big thing because if you're saying you're moving that far mm. literally at, at this end on all of them you know you've you've the bobbins moved about that much and had you've yeah. had about three or four beeps yeah yeah well it definitely went more than three or four beeps worth as to you know in your mind as to how far yeah. you go out there um uh, another one was very similar as well i think the second one was very similar um then the other one there was a slight difference with that one because as soon as i lifted it up actually it pulled backwards Right, that's interesting so, because with with the quiver arm, the first indication was a tiny beep down. Yep. Do, like ever so I've, slight, but a tiny beep down. And I, when I'm zig fishing, I use quiver arms. Yeah, yeah. And it is literally that arm stays in place until something moves. Yep. And that tiny little beep down, I would have been picking picking up the rod then. Yep. Yeah, well, without any shadow of a doubt, that's the thing to do. And I've seen that that done time and time and time again where I've been out with Carpology boys testing various different things. We've looked at stuff. As soon as the lead comes out of whatever it's gripping against, be it in weed, be it on the deck, be it whatever, as soon as it's lifted up, with a normal bobbin, nothing happens and I can move forwards. But with the springer arm, yeah. the stronger the springer arm, the more it gets pulled back. Yeah. And it's only slightly, yeah. but it is still slightly enough. I and, think and, potentially and it, to help that hook hold. It is hold. that slight that if you didn't have an alarm that was as sensitive as, as like an RX Plus on full sensitivity, yeah, yeah, you, you probably, probably wouldn't, wouldn't get it. the beat. No. Because it is Unless literally you're looking at it. It's an imperceptive dip down and then back up again, and that's yeah. where the lead has been lifted off the deck, gone back in and then goes out again. So because that tension at this end is trying to pull it back that way, which is great. So you know <laughs> That one, one of the things that, that we should look at is the difference when the lead comes off. Because the lead comes off in the fight, yeah. not necessarily when it's picked up. Yeah. So obviously when I'm picking up, the lead hasn't come off. So it'll no. be interesting to see in the future again what happens with a quick shake if the lead does come off. Yes. And then we go away to see if that makes any difference to how the strike feels. Yeah. Well, because I remember you've got a bow because it's too lead and then too hook. Yes. So there's there's always going to be a little bit, and the longer the hook link, the more there's going to be. There's going to be a little bit of pause while I can go even further. So there's me saying I'm going six foot, but actually I'm going six foot because that's got to straighten up. And there's a big hook link as well. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if, if I'm saying I moved six foot, well, if you were using a four foot hook link, you probably only moved two foot. Yeah. And then there's yeah. the straightening of the angle as well. So it might only be a foot and a half. So as daft as it sounds, actually, the indication comes very quickly, but yeah. the strike force on the hook comes a lot later. Yeah. Which so, is the, so, so the fish can move a lot further than the lead moves. Yes, yes. The fish will move a lot further. It can give you an indication, but it can move a lot further than you would think 
before you get the full-blooded, everything's been tightened up, straightened up, and it's off. Yeah. So if you get a screamer on a zig, it's been on a while. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's done a it's bit of movement. It's 20 yards away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you get any indication at all, like one bleep, I, I will hit one bleep. I do anyway, but yeah. I will hit one bleep. Yeah. But a lift, one bleep, a lift, one bleep, a drop, two bleeps, game over. Yeah, Absolutely, yeah. It's, definitely. It, it's on and off. And, yeah. 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 So fish it tight, whatever you do, and hit anything. And remember, it takes two seconds to chuck it back out again. Well, the action is continuing as it has done all the way through this, but I'm afraid this is the end of underwater answers about zig fishing. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned an awful lot. I'm sure you have too, but also actually there's quite a few questions unanswered, which we will come back and revisit at some stage in the future. If you've got any, ping them across to our page. We'll have a look at them. And all I've got to do now is say, if you don't zig fish, just get out there and have a crack at it because it is absolutely brilliant.